There's some who will really do well. Yeah. Well, the people with a lot of degrees and they're not lawyers. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> My, um, I've been watching uh, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Do you know the show? <laughs> <laughs> with my, with my they reboot the Fresh Prince of Bel Air too. Oh yeah, yeah. Anyway, so one of the one of the women on this show is like the former wife of a, a well known LA lawyer. And is that how they introduce him? I guess I don't know, but uh, you know, so there's a whole thing about. You know. <laughs> and is it enjoyable? Should we watch it? It's actually surprisingly interesting. The reason is because um, so what's interesting is that this guy, his name is Girardi, and uh, I met somebody once who worked for him. He was a excuse, so. Um, he was just a big like you know, he works sexual harassment causes all these cases but he, he apparently embezzled a lot and so um, but one of the questions is whether the, his ex-wife has some of that money and um, did they divorce is that a way of sort of saying that she doesn't have the money so part of the show is like do people believe her when she says that she doesn't have the money and stuff. it's kind of an interesting real life thing. <laughs> it's interesting anyway <laughs> You know, there's a lot of, you know, there's some game theory stuff in there if you like. Like, how do I show that I'm credible? You know, how do I, you know, like. They're all lying. <laughs> if you're rich, you lie. No. <laughs> and then going back, yeah, I mean, um, like, if you have, like, my friends who are professors in law schools, like, a lot of them, some of them have PhDs, but some of them don't, so they just have relevant experience. But if you have PhDs, then typically you do a lot of publishing. But, you know, yeah, and this one. Yeah, but they're like law journals, right? Yeah, that's what we were just talking about. So it's not really peer reviewed. Yeah, exactly right. right, right. So, you can. so the whole thing is a little squishy from the point of view. Of they're reviewed by like undergrads, right? The law students. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so you, you're more dismissive than I. Am. Yeah. I've seen what's published. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of it's good. But like. Yeah. yeah I don't know. I know. Well, maybe the peer review process is growing about it, so we should reevaluate that. You mean in, in our in mean regular? Like yeah, I mean, like, does it always have value? Yeah. The peer review process? Yeah. Okay, let's see. I mean, there's clearly cases where it doesn't work in the sense that, like, people write great papers that people love and then they didn't get accepted in the first journalist. Right. The main thing, people who would participate in this the discussion, so the, the other main thing, which is really true, is that it's really, really hard to find good reviewers. So yeah. the total demand on the discipline is extremely high. Like, so. I mean, as you get more and more senior, you spend more and more of your time not doing what you want to do and evaluating everyone else. So, like, like it's, it does something seem something kind of wrong that you maybe you spend like thirty percent of your life evaluating other people's stuff. You know, what's the point of that? I mean, you should spend some of it, but like, you know, I think it's anyway. But at the same time, that's kind of what when things get more and more specialized, more and more kind of complicated, that's kind of inevitable in a way. Right. And. Um, but, so I don't know if it's broken. At the same time, a lot of people who participate in the discussion don't realize that the main issue really is not whether you make good decisions about papers which are kind of okay, but um, there's just a lot of papers out there which are really, really bad. Like, you would like, you could just look and think, what's, what's going on here? Like, so like, when, we, were in the, when we, we did the uh, APSR in UCLA maybe 10 years ago, and just the amount of workload was huge, and, most of the workload was papers which you should have just simply said this is just a publishing. So, you know, a lot of people are thinking, oh, my paper was not accepted correct, you know, or it was not treated right, which is fine, but I mean, the bulk of the work is just rejecting all that stuff out there. So, like, if you people said, oh, well, we just have some sort of more free thing where people stuff in the public, you know, put stuff on their web pages, it's just fine, but basically, um, there has to be somebody kind of pushing back this dam, and this is this kind of well, this tsunami of really, really bad papers. You know, if that didn't happen, then it would just be a wash of these things, you know, papers which are not. But you can see, like, I'm sure that there are some journals that have very lax standards, so you can tell the right. difference, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think, I, mean, I don't know, in the review process, I think there are a lot of flaws, I think, over right. time, but it should be reformed. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just too. I think there are too many issues, right. and at the same time, it's just too vital to let go. Of. Too what? It's just too important to let go of. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. true. A lot of people say, like in the econ, there's this whole discourse about the top five items or something like, like you put way too much um, 
we are the very best journals. Like in political science, it's like the APSR. Right? Like that's like why is, you know, exactly why is that so important? It makes sense, you know. Um, it shouldn't be that important. Um, Maybe that's what people read. Yeah, but then you yeah, just have to read. People have to read. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of things. I mean, so again, again there's, maybe there's ways to reform it, but a lot of it is pretty inherent, you know, like um, in the sense that, well, for example, like 20, 30, 40 years ago, the number of people who wrote papers was just smaller. I mean, it was, and um, so just the total amount of work involved in these papers was much less. Well, there were less people. Though, yeah, exactly, fewer people. So in some sense, we have this big democratization. Right. And like a lot of universities. 40 years ago, didn't expect anything for, you could be on tenure just by getting good you know, teaching work. So now taking a few work with like, I don't know, Wabash College or something like that, to get tenure, you need to write some papers and stuff, which is great in some ways that we're broadening the research enterprise. But as a result, we just have so many more papers, so many more things to judge. And that's, I think that's really the, the root of it in a way. I, I mean, I'm not sure if there's a way of, no, the, I mean, the only way to make it better is to have people be more careful. But the only way people be more careful is just have to get more time more people involved, but you know, there's just this line that there aren't that many people who are really careful and good and want to spend their time. And it's even, right. even right now, it's hard to find those people. You well, know? are people said about this, like, if those people exist, do they actually, do they do that? Like, like what does it mean for a person to be careful? Is, yeah. The time and, and, and incentive to, to be that way, no? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Okay, so some journals do, like, give yeah. money for reviews and stuff, which is great. And, like, um, another, some places will give you money. So. Another big one is tenure letters. So if you come up for tenure, somebody will look at all your papers. It's just even more, it's not just one paper. You have to read almost everything they wrote. Right. Like a book, two books, several yeah, papers. I heard those are even a bigger nightmare. I mean, for reason, obvious reasons, but yeah. yeah. It's a lot of work. So yeah. maybe it takes you know, three or four days or something like that. You know? And like, so um, sometimes people are compensated a bit rarely. So why do I do that? Like, I mean, what is, and, um, but at the same time, you have to have you have to do that. People did it for me, right? I mean, you have to do that in order for the thing to work. Right? Somebody has to judge. But um, if you were to compensate it, I think compensation would help. But at the same time, um, no, one, it's never going to be an easy job. You know, it's never going to be like you, know, you can give me ten thousand dollars for doing this stuff. But I'm still if I still have to do five or six a year or whatever, it's still a big impact on me. You know, whatever. It's not. I really don't see. I, I don't know. I mean, to me, there's no obvious solution. I guess that's what I'm saying. I, I see it as really a deeply kind of resource constrained situation. But I mean, maybe maybe there are ways. I mean, I do you, is there a problem? I don't know if there's a problem with it, but is there a problem with the kind of people that they target to review? Uh -huh. Or is it like a biased population? Is it like mostly Americans, like 90 percent, or something like that? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. I might, I could have a less long time. <laughs> I also see this as kind of resource constrained thing. So like, so when you were leaving the APSR, um, for example, some people thought the APSR was famously not friendly to subfield X. You know, like it was very heavily weighted toward the American politics. It was. You know, and um, there were, you know, not so much on political theory, et cetera, et cetera. But then when we were editing it, you realize that the main driver of that is actually uh, people's submissions. So like if people don't think that the APSR is friendly to subfield X, people and subfield X don't want to submit to it, you have this kind of cycle. And then the only way to fix that is to go out to people and say subfield X and say, hey, send your proof to the APSR. And then they might do that, but if you do that, then you also have to find the reviewers and it takes a long time. And um, you know, when we did it, we had a thousand papers and submissions a year. We had seven editors. So like I was dealing with 140 papers, maybe two or three a week. And each time it comes in, you kind of think, oh, who could have sent this to, who could have sent this to? You get three or four reviewers, maybe you have to ask 10 people, because a lot of people just don't want to do it. Like they said, I, I wrote, I reviewed five papers last month, or something crazy like that. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, so. Um, well, that seems like where you have the incentive, is like, what does it mean you, you don't want to do it? Like, either you have well, yeah, environment, right. or, you have the, or you have the competition mechanism. Well, junior people feel obligated to do it, right? Yeah, exactly. So it should be in your, in your tenure file, it should be in your. That's true. Well, it is, like, I wrote. Huh? Service to the discipline. Yeah, it is. There's but a little is, bit. Is that ever? Does anyone ever? No one judges you on that. I mean, like. No, right. And so. No one doesn't give you tell oh, you didn't. No, exactly. Right. Yeah. Sure. Everyone right. tells me give you credit, but at the same time, <laughs> deep down, I mean, like, I think we should, It's great if you're a good citizen and you do lots of refereeing or something. But if that's all you do, I'm, I, I'm not going to favor you getting. You know, I, I. Yeah. You know, you have to do something new and interesting research, yeah. like. Right. And so I mean. So I don't know. It means like. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could hire a completely separate bunch of people who do nothing but yeah. review. 
right? But how they have the expertise. Yeah, exactly. How would they have expertise? How would they know? How would they see it from a research point yeah. of view? You know, so, so mm -hmm. really, we just need to find a way to incentivize, like, make it a more important part of the, you know, process. Well, there's whole, the whole workload of issues. Yeah, that, yeah. Like, there's too many things that. Yeah, exactly. I just yeah. don't know. I mean, um, I don't well, the publishing industry is BS anyway. But. Yeah, but <laughs> we talked about this, but I think that there's no easy. I mean, yeah. how would you fix it? That's kind of the thing, right? You can incentivize all these things, but does that mean that like 20 or 30 percent of the, the academy would be basically famous just because they refereed a lot of papers? You yeah. Know? Um, I don't know, right? And you know, you'll never, like, no one's going to give you the Nobel Prize for saying, hey, you did a great job refereeing. You know, that's just not going to happen, right? No, because that really isn't a deep down as big a contribution as doing some, like, a re giving you know, a great world a great idea. You know, it just isn't. Right. So you mean that people will always have an incentive to yeah, exactly. do it? Exactly. Right, right. I mean, even if you pay them, it's great that people will be paid them, yeah. but like. But the marginal utility to, to an hour research is going to be more than. Yeah, I think so. You could have dedicated reviewers, though. I mean, like. Yeah, I mean, like, I think, like, if you look at the big journals like Nature and Science, they have a large dedicated staff, a lot of the PhDs. And they know what they're doing. They kind of know what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. But they're never going to be able to judge something from the research frontier. They could say this paper sucks and, you know, just throw that away. But if you actually have to, to make really, you know, Sure. Correct judgments. You have to be kind of right there. You have to say, is this really the news? Is this something we could have done done five years ago? Is that kind of thing? Yeah. Non science yeah. journals, they, they, they must have a better way of doing this because they have a much quicker turnaround. Yeah, yeah, much, much, much faster. But also, their papers are a lot shorter. Yeah. And it's also. Um, well, we could write shorter papers. <laughs> maybe, it is, or maybe it is a resource thing because they, they do generally have more resources. So maybe it is, maybe we could just get more resources into our field. Probably. But they're saving lives. Well, we're saving like we're saving democracy, right? I mean, like, you know, like we're saving democracy. Yeah, the people studying like kangaroo rats in like you know some city or whatever probably found them. There's a lot of new stuff in there. Basic, too. basic research is very important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I just, yeah like kangaroo rats. The people studying like the blithe chromosome of the ninety four. I mean, it's like it's. There's a bunch of navel gazing there. Damn! Wow. Exactly right. I think it's just for attacking science. <laughs> Look at PFAS. It's like it's an unintelligible. Yeah, I don't know. It's, there's a sort of Why democracies fail? That's what we do. <laughs> every single every, every day. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, like, a lot of things are like that. Like, again, like, um, you have a lot of people. It's great that research is more democratized, but there are a lot of people who write papers which are not that interesting, and they know that themselves. I mean, but they do it to get kind of tenure, you know, in Wabash College or whatever, you know, and which is great in a way, but it's also like, for example, another thing like this is when we do the APSR, we got a bunch of papers from second year graduate students. We thought what's going on here, and it turns out that there was one college, maybe this was a pretty good program, maybe it's like University of Ontario, or University of Toronto, was and they had one, they basically required that every second year graduate student, I think, like submit a paper to the APSR. That was kind of the requirement. It's called <laughs> just submit, like not necessarily get accepted. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you want to get accepted. Did I get accepted? Get accepted. Get accepted. Get accepted. I mean, uh, so, I think the answer is no. Not too many of them got accepted. Or even made it very far. But I feel like that that really helps. Oh, like, just okay. really puts so the pressure. Like it's we're not, the professors aren't going to grade them, so the students have like much more pressure. Right, on right. Them. So okay, so yeah, just give it to their. You know, it sounds like a great good. idea, but imagine if every single PhD program in the United States did that. Yeah. So then, like we instead of a thousand papers, we're getting like fifteen hundred papers yeah. or something like that. So yeah. you're basically just offloading the, your you know your advisory status to the APSR. <laughs> That's kind of what's happening. And so it's a great idea, but it's like, you know, I, I don't know if that's really the best thing, you know, so I really don't know. Why don't they just submit an APSR quality paper to the department? And then <laughs> <laughs> that's technically what we have here. If I were a PhD student, I would simply submit APSR quality work all the time. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, just make a choice, make it happen. Well, <laughs> well, APSR quality is not what we're doing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, everyone says, you know, we should be more careful and read the papers, you know, and not be so um, influenced by the names, like the no numbers, the top three, big five stuff. But then you actually have to read the papers, and that takes time. So, I, I, I really. Also, I mean, you're not a big co author. Huh? I just went through all your, your articles. Oh, means? Well, I went through everyone in the department. Yeah, I'm not a big co author. Special. I'm, I'm making a network uh -huh. of co authors. Oh, yeah, yeah. The bottom line is no one co author. Is it a part? It's kind of interesting. I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you when I have it. You know. I think Chad does. Chad cooperates and Graham does. Well, within the department is the question. Oh, Chad? Chad and Graham have a paper together. 
What do you think is the, is the closest relationship? To me or to? No, like co-authors. Yeah, we don't have a lot of that kind of co-author. No. Yeah, not a ton. Yeah, yeah, not a ton. Matt and Gary, Cigarette. Oh, okay, that makes sense. I've written 16 articles together. Okay. Well, that's another thing. Okay, so Interesting. another aspect of, so when I first started publishing, Co-authoring was really <laughs> <laughs> co wasn't really that big a thing because I, like I was in graduate school, 85, 89. If you look at papers then, there was a lot more single authoring, and one of the reasons sure. was because there was no email. Yeah. The simplest that, like, there, if you had a co-author in your physical vicinity, made a big deal. Now, you know, email started to become more of a thing in the 90s, and um, then there's lots of co-authoring. It's gotten more and more. Electronic. Like so, yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> this is before Slack. <laughs> okay, so now that we have Slack and Discord, man. Yeah, exactly. We're all set. But no excuses. Is is co-authoring a good thing? Okay, I think it, it is for sure. In the sense that a lot of stuff gets done which would not have been able to get done before. But part of me thinks so. It kind of adds to this whole thing in a way because it makes it possible to write more papers. Um, so there's more papers. And my feeling overall is, if there's one person in a paper, that person is really like responsible for that paper. You know, so one thing that's thing about never co-authoring is you never write a paper which you don't really care that much about. But if you co-author a lot, like a paper with five authors, it's totally possible every single co-author is like, mm, this is okay, but you know, no one's really like taking responsibility for it. And right. so therefore, you have kind of just a lot of papers just floating around which are just there because people think, well, you need to write a bit of a paper and you know, get credit for it and stuff. So that's kind of like. I'm not sure if that's good either, to be honest. So I think that I do there should be a lot more, each paper should be high quality, each paper should be something which one really, really cares about, and maybe there'll be fewer papers overall. But maybe also that's not fair, because maybe you, know, you and your five friends are great co-authors, and you're doing work that you never done at all, so I, I don't know, I really don't know. But that's another thing which um, is making the whole process more demanding, in a way. Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, a lot of people say, oh, I co-author because I, you know, we need to have this combination of skills, like theory, empirical work, blah, 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 which is great. At the same time, it also raises the bar for everyone else. It's harder, you know, and, I don't know. People want to write, they just get more credit. You can get a lot more credit for writing five, like, when you write a co-author paper, you almost get credit for more than the one over N. Like, if you write, like, you can get tenure with, like, 10 co-author papers, but it's hard to get tenure with five single author papers, example. So um, there's kind of a reason to kind of call there just to get the numbers up. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I mean, um, which is great, but again, it's kind of like, I don't know, I, I have a little experience about that. I don't know. I'm a more old school single author kind of person. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I'm also a very small producer, so who knows all the other great papers I could have written, how much the world would be better <laughs> if I didn't know how to co author or something. How many lives you would have saved? Exactly right. <laughs> How many democracies would have been saved? <laughs> like turkey's on you. <laughs> exactly, it's all there. It's, uh, I don't know all these things. I mean, overall, a lot of things would be better. Okay. <laughs> if there were more jobs, a lot of these things would be better because. Yeah. Well, now the economy can tr contract it. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, just more academic jobs. And people don't realize why. I mean, there's a lot of complaints about why there's fewer academic jobs. So if there are more academic jobs, that just means the sector is bigger. So there's more people around, more people who are being paid, and those people can then have time to work on these things. Right. Okay, so why is it, why is it um, not as big? So the problem with it is, you know, investment in higher education is much smaller than it used to be. Like, just think of the number of UC schools per capita in California is much less than it was in 1960, just because the population of UC is like, with California is maybe 50% the double of what it was 40 years ago. We don't have double number of UC campuses and stuff like that. And the other one is um, um, the end of mandatory retirement. So like when I was in, um, this is also not often understood, which is when I was in graduate school, like in 85, you had no professors who were American like who were above 65, because that was mandatory retirement. That was just a thing. And so that got, they got rid of that for, I think, very reasonable reasons, like civil rights type reasons, because you can't just age discriminate. And so around the 1990s, you had the end of mandatory retirement. And therefore, a lot of departments kind of switched over to, from being like one third assistant, one third associate, one third full, to now the situation where almost all departments are 80% of the professors. 
it's because you have a bunch of people from age 65 to 85 and go on. Is that good or bad? It's great if it's bad for us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a little fair in a way because, like, you know, it's unfair to say some, you're just too old for this job, right? In, in some sense, right? That's a civil rights thing. Yeah. But overall, it's bad. Yeah, overall, it's bad for the discipline, period, I think. It's also just another way which people get richer. I mean, so that's another thing which is when people talk about, you know, right. income inequality, some of it is just simply people living longer. So the longer people live, the more time you have to basically increase you know, your assets. Before you had 30 or 40 years, now you have 50 or 60 years or whatever. Right? And so um, similarly in academia, like, if you're a full professor, you can be a full professor for a long time, so you can kind of just build on that. And, you know. and so, you know, it's, uh, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. that's the Which is why, you know, while you are in charge of the department, you're going to kick everyone out. <laughs> <laughs> If only. No, I mean, you can't do that. Move the department to Florida. <laughs> well, we we just need like we need to move to the corporate model where after a certain point you you don't you don't stay CEO or whatever you just become like an advisor or whatever. Yeah, there's, right. a board, there's a board. There's a board. You know, you can be on the UCLA board of you know every faculty. <laughs> <laughs> no, being a member of the faculty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Being a member of the faculty is not bad at all. But I mean, like, yeah. these emeritus professors get like five times the office space that we do, and we like work here. You yeah. know, <laughs> so it's, it is really ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, I I'm hoping to make it like, I don't know. I showed you the room closets here. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I showed you I some, there's some faculty here who've been here almost 60 years, and I'm, that's that's my plan. Like, I'm, I hope that I'm not like, don't throw me to the wolves, do everybody. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm going to try to be productive. But, like, you know, overall, you know, in society, I'm not sure if that's good. You know? Oh, okay, this is another thing. So, for example, in Korea, there still is mandatory time. So, as a result, you have all these 65 year olds running around, like, not knowing what to do. And that's why one of my friends said that's why, why they're saying. Sorry, why do they not know what to do? Because they kicked out of the job. Well, but there is more to life. I don't know that that's going to yeah, work. Exactly, but like, you tell me when you're 65, like, you just say, I don't get a job. I mean, it's like, that's the one reason one of my friends said that's why there's so many cafes and like, little things like that in Korea. Because Huh? Yeah. Fried chicken joint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they go and talk and eat and have a good time. <laughs> oh, they open up fried chicken joint. Oh, they open up fried chicken joint. Everyone likes fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's socially optimal. <laughs> <laughs> socially optimal. These are all like retired professors who don't have the business experience. Yeah. So maybe they don't do very well. Is the fried chicken good? No. They're like <laughs> terrible business model. They just, they can't matter. Oh, wow. Dude. I know what I'm reading about. Surely there's a book about this. <laughs> this whole, all these things are interesting to me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway. All right, so um, let's just. Brain, <laughs> let's talk about. I try to I simplify the, the model we did. This is the. the um, this, did I say this is called Market for Lemons? Yeah. What did I say? Remember? Lemons? Lemons, like a car. Okay. Lemon, okay. Yeah. So like, there's either the car is either bad, good. It's always bad. <laughs> this could be about. <laughs> so fried chicken could be good or bad. Okay. Yeah, market fried. <laughs> so if it's you a bad. Right now, until you bite into it. <laughs> I went to Kyochan. Do you know what I'm talking about? What's this? Kyochan. It's like a famous. Kyochan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a famous chicken town, a fried chicken place in Korea town. Yeah. It's, it's good. good. Kyochan. Okay. Anyway, there weren't that many people here. The chicken, I think, was a lot worse. I think it got worse in the last six months. You think so? I don't know. I was, it used to be so good. They get an influx of retired professors. <laughs> That's always really sad. That's like a heartbreak for me. You have your spot, and maybe something happens. Yeah, exactly. It is a yeah, sad situation. Yeah, the same. <laughs> okay, so it's a bad car. The seller of buys at one, the buyer at three, so the car seller of buys at five, the buyer at seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I found a little bit of simpler way to do it. So I, I'm going to just say that so nature does either bad or good. Okay, I think last time I had, there were two possible um, offers you could make. Two, four, and six, but I'm just going to make it four and six. Okay. And kind of the idea is, Four is like the average, um, so like 
the seller on average thinks the car is worth three, right? The buyer on average thinks the car is worth five. So the four is the price which you could, you could sell the car on average. All right, so. Um, So this is just very similar to what we did before, just to go into two for simple things. So anytime there's a rejection, this is zero, zero. Okay. If a seller sells a bad car for six, the buyer accepts it. Um, the seller gets five, right, because it's six minus one. The seller sells a good car at the price of six, it's a bad car. So then the buyer is three. Okay. This is a good car. It's a good car, right? The seller sells it for four and hence loses one on the deal. The buyer gets a car with seven to them. Four to two. Okay, all right. So let's do the complete information version here. Okay, if it's a, bad, if it's a bad car and the seller offers four, what does the buyer do? Buyer would sell. Well, buyer, the buyer does it. So it was rejected, right? Because that's right, yeah. yeah. Seller for score, yeah. zero bucks. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh. Buy yourself, sorry. If seller for, for six, the buyer still rejects, what's it? Yeah, yeah zero. Yeah. Because if it's a bad car, the buyer doesn't, it's only worth what, three to the buyer, so this buyer's not going to accept the price of the Okay, if it's a good car and seller for score, what does the buyer do? So Accept. Okay, with the seller offer six. Accepts also, right? Okay, it's a good car. The buyer likes it. Okay. Given that if it's a bad car, what does the seller do? The seller offers four, so it gets zero. Seller offers six, gets zero. Neither way is no sale, right? Before we had the seller could offer two, which there would be a sale. Yeah. But I just thought it was simply So let's just say this. How about here? What does the seller do here? Um, so for six, right? Six. Because it'll be bought either way, so um, one's better than one. All right. So in this case, um, trade does happen if it's a good car, right? Okay. And um, trade could happen if it's a bad car for the past two. Okay, so no problem. Any questions? Yeah? Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so now let's do the same thing where both people do not know. That's what we do. Now. This is where the seller doesn't know that it's bad good. Same game as before, I just put a lot of bubbles everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll know me by my little chicken joint in Westwood. <laughs> to say hi when I'm there. <laughs> sure. Are you offering us jobs at UCLA? Exactly. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. This is the Okay. All right. Okay. So this is accept and reject. Accept and reject. Accept and reject. Accept and reject. Same number system. Same number system. Same number Okay, same as this, I just put a bunch of bubbles. Okay, we did this, I think, already, but I want to solve for all Nash equilibria. Before it was complicated because we had, that's why I made it simple, we had like um, two, four, and six, there were like eight possible strategies for the buyer, but now there's only four, so let's just see. How, so how many strategies does a seller have? Two, just, you know, so one is, you just, um, four, four, six, six, right? Okay. I should be careful that I don't see inflammatory things which are recorded. I don't know. I feel like my generation in particular, so I went I know I I graduated my PhD in nineteen ninety two, so I've been doing this for like thirty years. 
I feel like um, my generation is like right in the sweet spot because, <laughs> because we have pretty good health care. So like people are much older than us, the health care was much worse, it really was. But we were not so young that we, were, we still were able to buy houses. <laughs> Seriously. So we have pretty good health care. We were able to buy a house, and we are in the old retirement system. If you were like much younger, you can't buy a house. The retirement system is a lot worse. Yeah. So but the healthcare is much better, but not as much as, you know. So, so when people start attacking the older people, I'm thinking, hmm, at what point does that become me? <laughs> Seriously. It's like, hmm. <laughs> Because it, you know, I don't know. What's not the worst instinct? Not for you in particular, but like, you know, mm -hmm. in general, it can make people like more inclined to, yeah, to think about future generations. Yeah. Maybe not for the best reasons, but. Yeah, I guess you're right, yeah. Okay, not in your particular case, but <laughs> just in general. <laughs> no, but it, did you realize that, I mean, okay, so like, oh, how does this come up? So, we, you know, when we came to Los Angeles in 2001, so we bought, a, we bought a, our condo in Chicago in 1992 for $96,000, which seems like nothing. Like, our mortgage payment was like $500 a month. You know, so our real estate payment, you know, was me and my wife, I was an assistant professor there. We could totally afford it. It was not a big deal at all. It was cheaper than rent. You just had to get 20% down payment. It was like, I don't know, $20,000. It wasn't that big a deal. Anyway, we came to me. Then when we came to Los Angeles, all the houses we could possibly afford, you know, with kids and everything, were like, 1.2, 1.5, that kind of thing. And um, so we were able to do that. But now no one could do that now. It's like, there's no way. Like, the houses in our neighborhood are like four or five million dollars. Right? It's like, who can do that? And so like, but first of all, there's some people who can, like they wouldn't do whatever. Um, another big difference is now there's a lot of like private capital firms which are buying. Just so, so how do you, you can't possibly compete against somebody that's like billions of dollars in assets mm -hmm. or something crazy. Right. So um, yeah, so it's a really a lot worse, you know, and um, if you look at now the um, um, starting salaries of assistant professors, it's definitely much higher than it was when I started. Like when I started, my salary was forty six thousand dollars in nineteen ninety one. Okay, however, the starting salary of assistant professors has not gone up much in the last ten years. It's kind of maybe ten percent in the last ten years. That's not. Which is like considering how much rents have gone up. That's really. Yeah. So I, 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 where, I don't know where this fits in, but I know, like I've noticed this. I, I don't ask directly. But I noticed like a lot of professors have s they make so much money from research, oh, like just millions upon millions. And I, I mean, I hear that some professors uh, they make six, high six figures. And the other thing is the grants. I don't know how the grants work, but it seems like a lot of the grants come in, and a lot of it is like income. Like it's like you know a wage or something. I don't know how that works. But I don't know. I'm not a big grant person myself, yeah. but um, you can get. Oh, okay. Um, you can put summer nights on your grants. So what does that mean? So strictly speaking, our salaries are nine months. So you can get extra funding, even though we get a paycheck every month, I get a paycheck. But you can get extra funding for research. Traditionally, that's how it was. Back in the day, you didn't get paid every nine months. So you would apply for other places, say, hey, could you help fund my research? Mm -hmm. So you can usually get up to three summer nights from a grant. But I don't think you can get like hundreds of thousands of dollars. But if you do, there might be some other way of doing it. But some people's grants are very large, but they typically yeah. use it for, you can use it to, to teach for your courses, you know, support graduate students. Okay. But uh, maybe there's something I don't know, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, mm. I don't know. I people, also, people do consult. I, think. I was just going to say myself, too. I mean, like, some of my friends in Chicago were, they were just, like, consultants on um, fever cases. Yeah. When I was there, everyone was talking about consulting, because I, I did my master's there, got a PhD, and everyone there, they all said that as soon as they graduate, they're going to go to DC to consult. Oh, yeah. And there were some students that came that said that they were being paid so much money to I don't even know what consult means, <laughs> no, no. but like that's what they're being paid to do whatever they're doing. That's why people are so bad at consulting. They make PowerPoint presentations and yeah. <laughs> fly around the country. I mean, I'm and then they all, all a little bit joking. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I heard that if you speak a, a language or if you have stuff like that, then you're much more valuable. Right. Yeah. It's kind of hard if you can't communicate. Yeah. I don't know. No, I mean, like, I know. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, exactly. I mean, I would think so. I mean, I don't know. Where was the good Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some. 
So like, you know, people's salaries, some academic salaries are high, and they're darn high. I mean, they're, when I first got in this business, I thought it'd be like my dad, I thought he'd actually Alabama was not a glamorous place for them. But, um, you know, they're very tough places. You know, people are making 400, 500, 600,000, even like, it's social, not that it's not dead, it's something, you know, like social science. And, um, you know, um, is that good or bad? Okay, um, in some ways, maybe it's not so good because maybe you could hire like five assistant professors yeah. instead of one. Okay, at the same time, you think, well, the whole thing is competitive, right? So, you know, if somebody's really doing well, we want them to work we are in, and we have an open market. But if some university wants to give you $500,000 to come there, is that bad for anybody? I mean, maybe that's, we should be all, or, you know, or this is something which we should be appreciative of. Anybody, you know? So, I don't know. I mean, that's also part of it is this length of your career thing, too. It's like, maybe it's okay if you get paid $500,000 for five years. But if you get paid for 25 years, you know, maybe that's another thing. You know? So, I don't know. You know? I don't know. I know, when, when I was in graduate school, the big thing was whether you teach at a business school or not. Like, business school salaries are much, much higher, like twice as high almost. And um, I made a decision that I'm not going to do because it's super, super boring. But um, is it bad? You know, my wife teaches in um, history, like Asian languages and cultures. Her salaries are much lower, like, by factor of two. And yeah. you know, so if some full professors in her field get paid the same as our assistant professors in our department. Yeah. You know, so is that bad? You know. oh, they hate it. I mean, they think it's standard. standard. I, I thought it was to be standardized. I didn't know that. No, it's not standardized. Well, it's all driven by the market. So it's, uh, but I don't understand why. It's just supply. Mm -hmm. You know, like we could be consultants. <laughs> 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 they could be consultants. I mean, this is like Andy also whole thing, right? It's like we don't pay politicians enough, so nobody that should that we want to run is running because oh, yeah. instead the CEO of Enron or whatever. You could make <laughs> the same argument, I guess, anywhere, including in. Yeah, yeah. Do we want the people to be professors, or do we want to be the dean, you know, Deloitte consultants? Or whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know, when I before I became chair, like, you know, like when our deans are paid, well, they pay. I don't know what they're paid, but they're paid in three hundred to four hundred thousand something like that. Who is it? Our deans, for example. Our you know, maybe Emily Carter is yeah. paid six hundred thousand. Deans are as the highest paid, highest paid Oh, okay. Yeah. I have one of them. She's just presenting right now. <laughs> but um, you you make about the median. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Dan Thompson makes the least. Tell. He was just like, anyway. <laughs> what was he Yeah, saying? he makes almost half a million dollars. Yeah. So I used to think more than half with uh, benefits. Yeah, so this is like really unfair, but then I'm gonna think about it. I mean, you you make you make a fair salary. <laughs> you can look up my wife's too. You make three hundred twenty seven thousand. Really? With benefits. That's oh with benefits. Yeah. yeah. I think pre benefits is the it's a the low price. But what was I going to say? Before I thought that was really high and like ridiculous, but now I'm thinking, it's you would, I would never do that job with that kind of stuff. There's no way I would do that job. Seriously, like I'm barely hanging on to the department chair two forty whatever. Like I don't, I do not want that job, you know. And like, you know, well, the starting salaries. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we get paycheck. That's true. So <laughs> union power. <laughs> This is the last one. Yeah. We could talk about this for a long time. <laughs> sure can. It's really. <laughs> What's amazing to me is that it's how much it's changed just in the last five years. I mean, not even just like. It's also gotten worse over the last 20 years, but even compared to five years ago, things are much, much worse in housing and all that stuff. Like, I mean, that's better. I think it's just, you know, like maybe purchasing power. Yeah. People just can't afford what they used to. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just, literally it's just housing in California, though, so basically we can literally just build more housing. Yeah, exactly. Like, right. Almost all of this problem. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Not to, I don't know, not to, like, take away from the multi-quarter sequences on this stuff, but I'm sure the public policy school, but, like, it is also not that complicated. Yeah, that's But then that would lower the, the you know, price of rent. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, price of, the housing prices, sorry. <laughs> Oh, yeah. When I was in graduate school, like, I shared an apartment, like a three bedroom apartment in Chicago where Anderson was like $1,100, and my rent was $300 a month, and my stipend was 740 I remember that. Chicago was, I, I was surprised at how much more expensive it is here than Chicago. Yeah, yeah. It's you can get, like, a 
I don't know, Penthouse yeah. apartment in Chicago for like some really bad apartment here, like a same price. Right? Yeah. And you lived in Chicago, but it's going to be a little bit of market. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's, uh, it's not like living in the summer, but not. Yeah. Just, it, is, it is not just the supply. It's, it's not just the demand issue. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Good. Lu Wei Ying, our new assistant professor, coming. She said she's from Sense. Um, St. Louis. She says she has a new one-bedroom apartment that's rent six hundred dollars a month. Yes, in St. Louis. So. Oh, well, St. Louis. Yeah. yeah so. They have the national park, though. <laughs> St. Louis Arch. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we don't have a national park. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can go on on about this. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I, I uh, yeah, I really, uh, I mean, like, uh, so many things. Like, so. Well, what's, yeah, I mean, is it, is it, is everyone being strategic in terms of homeowners and policymakers? Well, I don't know, like, for this housing thing, I've always wondered about that because, like, you know, this is capitalism, right? It's something like, like, it seems like a lot of people can make money making houses, right? So how could anyone be against it? Well, it's capitalism, but it's only because of the intense level of local control that exists in California. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's, yeah. it's almost, you know, there, there are market distortions. They're yeah, exactly, right. They're structured in a very, very different way. Right, right, right. The health of housing is here is so, so different that, like, I feel like what I'm used to, yeah. I feel like a lot of foreigners that live here are just shocked at how housing is structured here. Yeah. Because everything is so planned. I, from where I'm from, at least. Right. The government plans, like, where people can live and then divides. Like, they'll cut up the... Mm. Like the area or, and stuff like that, to make sure that people buy the plots and build them where they can buy ready to rent yeah. houses, or it's just like a housing scheme where the government just gives right. out free houses for the world or something. Right. Uh, but in the U.S., it's so strange. You can, I mean, theoretically, you can just go really, really, really out there, like right. in Joshua Park, and find some unclean territory, I guess, mm -hmm. private property. I don't know how that works, but you you can. You can. Yeah. It's a national park. You can. No, so not federal land. I mean, just like you not part of. There's no, yeah. there's no, there's no land that isn't it's owned by the government or owned by. There's no way to say land. Then I think I, I have my go. There, there is, there is federal land that's managed by like the Bureau of Land Management, for example, where people have like grazing rights or other rights, and, and that it's owned by the federal government, but it's sort of like probably leased out. Yeah. There, there is places you can free them. Yeah, okay. that would be. Uh, That'll solve all our problems. But like, you're only supposed to. Right. You're not so supposed you can't, you can't live there. Yeah, that's the thing. You're supposed to like move every few weeks or something. Well, from what I know, like, there are so many towns in the U.S. that come, that pop up in different states. Oh, yeah. Like uh, in Florida, there are so many like uh, retirement Hoover towns. Hoover towns? Like the plant community. Uh, I think you mean like the villages, for example. The villages. The biggest one, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. You know, like, if, well, I was gonna thought you were gonna say something like in Asia, like you go there, like in Korea, and you see these huge, you know, 50-story structures and stuff. We should just do that here. Just yeah. make a hundred of those things. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah. I mean, you know? your your home will depreciate in value. Not you. Sorry, I, I I shouldn't be so direct, but like that's. I, mean, I think we, I think we know the first part. It's the second part that is the oh is the rub. Right. Oh, because you know, like no, we should absolutely infill everything, but we yeah. should allow that to happen with local control. And yeah, exactly. Right. But no, process. I don't think my house would lose value. I think it would go up in value. Well, yeah. Yeah, but um, but you're right. I mean, Eventually, it, maybe. It's all about local. Yeah. There's so much local control in the U.S. That's one of the big differences. Yeah. yeah. In in California, especially. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So is the car good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Can you explain that? Is it? Isn't the other person indifferent in that first? In this one? Zero, yeah, zero, zero, yeah, zero. yeah, exactly. Here, you oh, can but be is, is it because the because the bar is the four and six? Who's off? The cell is offering four or six. So um, the reason I okay, we we're okay. So the car is either worth three or seven to the buyer. Okay, on the seller can offer it's either worth one or five. Okay, if it's a bad car, the seller it's worth one to the seller and three to the buyer. Uh huh. Since we're saying the seller can only offer four or six, this price is too high for the buyer, right? Because mm -hmm. the seller, the buyer only wants like some more. They would, yeah. But they would reject it either way. Yeah, they did. They yeah, rejected. So shouldn't they be indifferent? Yeah, they are. I so, mean, the, so why would they choose the four over the six? Then? Oh, there's no reason. Uh, this, okay. So this is one. This is one SPE and other. Okay. Shouldn't one they want 
the theoretical, I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. They're just comparing this to zero and zero. Okay. It's a different thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but, so this is this is a match something. Yeah, got it, got it. Yeah, okay. So whatever here. There's two strategies for the seller. And then there's buyers of how many strategies? Oh boy. I think A A or R R here, right? And then A A or R here. Let's do this. That's right, yes? Sure. Okay, so what goes in here? This is what? Uh, four, oh, sorry, here. Four, except, so it's three, negative one sometimes, and then it's going to be four, negative one, four. Do you see where I'm getting that, right? It's four, four, and then both times it gets accepted. So I think this is going to be one. Okay, this is going to be four, accept, accept, and then reject here, but it's going to be, I think it's the same, right? Because, yeah, yeah it's still the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now this is going to be four zeros, right? Uh -huh. yes. And then this simply is what? Four user rejects in here. How about this? This is six. And then it's now it's only this is the only relevant part right here. It's except so it's half of this, it's five negative three. And then one more. So this is three. That's one. <laughs> I just have a I just I don't know. Okay. Why do people spend so much time in the internet and also eating? <laughs> It's because if the price of a house is large, the price of internet and food is small relative to it. So <laughs> this is my <laughs> It's like that's where you get comfort in life, you know. <laughs> but people spend the same amount of time eating and on the internet they live in Chicago, you know. <laughs> oh that's true, we'll say uh, uh, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no variation in your department. Except that they live up like in Joshua Tree, yeah, they can't use internet. Okay, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. So much money there. <laughs> okay. This is six is R R, right? <laughs> this is A, anyway, this is fine. Okay, let's see what's an actual equilibrium. The best response here is this. Here is the ones. This response here is the zeros. I think we have one, two, two right? Two Nash equilibrium. Uh -huh. Okay, so one is so four in the R. Uh -huh. okay. And the other one is uh, six, six. Okay, let's see which one are um, P, B, and E's. Okay, let's think about how we make them P, B, and E's. So let's do this one first. Four, four, and then A, A. Okay. We have to write down the police. What police do I put in here? Half half, right? Because these actually occur, right? So this one actually occurs is probably huh? What beliefs do I put in here? This is one of those zero zero situations, right? So I can put anything and be completely consistent. What goes in there? Maybe I don't know. Gonna have to put something which makes like if we did zero one, that would be consistent, but it wouldn't make choosing R right, sequential rash, right? So we need to put more on here. Yeah. So I think we could do one zero here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
All right. Okay. So we have this. Is this uh, um, PBNE? Um, given these beliefs, is plan A sequential rational for person B here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's going to be like one versus zero. How about here, given these beliefs? Yeah, person B is choosing zero minus three. How about S? So oh, we got to put beliefs here too. For that mm -hmm. What beliefs do we have to put here? F -f. That has to be right. No other belief would be consistent because it's going to Okay, by plane four, um, person one is getting three half a time, they get one half a time, which is one. They're going to put six, they get zero. Yeah, so this is a PBN. Let's check this one. Go to your class and say, hey, why should I accept your authority? Because somebody else in this department is getting paid a lot more than you. <laughs> <laughs> I had friends who taught in business schools, and like the, the MBA students would actually come and say, could you tell me what your qualifications are to teach this class? <laughs> they say this, well, I got a PhD. <laughs> What's your qualification to learn? <laughs> I think you see it among undergrads for sure. And um, timely, I guess, for yeah, yeah. where we are right now. Yeah, exactly. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, I guess. You know, if you talk to well, if you talk to people of my generation, they will say, Oh, when I was an undergrad I got to explore so many different things, I took this class, there this but people forget that that People just don't feel like they have that kind of time or ability anymore just because of the whole job market. And here you see why it's really hard to get into classes and all that. You know, so. I mean, what, yeah, what, what a college unit is has changed so much. Sorry? Like, like what, what a college is. Like what yeah, a college yeah. Is. absolutely. It's, it's more, it's more very, very interesting, I guess. But. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's do this one. This is 6-6. Six, six. I was looking up the... Um, the numbers of political science majors. So UCLA would produce more political science BA graduates of any other school in the top 25 by a factor by 60% more than closest competitor, which is Berkeley. So we produce more than Ohio State, all these huge schools. Oh, uh, political science BAs. Really? And we also produce almost twice as many Latinx BAs in political science than any other. Our closest competitor is UC San Diego. Yeah. And so uh, we're just a large, we just produce BAs. That's one of the things we do. Um, what what way is it going with this? Um, Isn't Berkeley the similar size department though? Yeah, exactly. Oh, this is our yeah. They're the same size department, and the demographically they're very similar. And San Diego's to us too, so it's not like we we are you know we have the same basically percentage of Latino students as Berkeley and San Diego, but we produce almost twice as many Latinx BA graduates. Yeah. So um, I think that's great. I mean, well, we have the Latino uh, policy. Yeah, it could be, yeah, exactly. It could be what we're deciding to do here. The reason I brought this up is, for example, at Stanford, this is it's a very, like, at Stanford, like, almost two thirds of the undergraduates study computer science now. Like, a lot. And, like, so it's a different idea of a grad, uh, college. And um, the number of, guess how many political science BA students there are at Stanford? So we have, we graduate 500 a year. How many does Stanford graduate? 50. 50. <laughs> yeah. We produce 10 times as many political science PAs as Stanford does. And I don't think Stanford's going to change that. No, exactly. They right. have their so exactly. And they have a they much larger part than we do, too. They're extra special. <laughs> <laughs> they're all, they're all world-class basketball players, right? <laughs> anyway. What, what beliefs go in here? These all set up. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Okay, what beliefs go in here? This one. Yeah, they have to be because sellers are putting six. Everyone's putting all this. Both, both sellers are putting six. Okay, what, what goes in here? The problem with this occurs is a zero, right? This is one of those zero zero situations, right? So um, you can put anything, any belief would be consistent. So one zero. One zero. Oh, what are we putting? Oh, or R, right? We need to make that R, R hat. Okay. Is that going to work? Yeah, because we need this one. Yeah, zero's going to be. Yeah, exactly. Okay, if there was a one here, then this would not, R would not be rational. Okay. Those are both fours, right? So we're not going to get there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, so. That's why it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Any belief here would be consistent. Okay. Now, let's see. I think we're going okay, beliefs. Is the bias sequential rational here? Uh, yes, right? Given, given this belief is zero than last one. Okay. Is the bias sequential rational here? They're getting zero. If they were to deviate, we get yeah. one. And, and. How about the seller? Seller's getting zero. If they were to do four instead, they would get zero. So, yeah. so anyway, so this is also PBD. Okay. Cool. This is an interesting one because, like, in some sense, you could have trades. So at least here, trade is happening sometimes, right? Okay. Here, the um, um, the when trade happens when there's a big car and the seller off the score. Is that right? No, but sorry. This, both cars get sold for, right? Good and bad cars get sold for. In this case, um, the buyer ex rejects everything, and given that the buyer rejects everything, it doesn't matter what the seller does. And so say the seller, and if the seller offers six, then the buyer says, well, um, you know, that's too high for all of this. Okay. Anyway, but at least trade happens. I guess a fair amount of trade happens, right? Both cars got sold. Like the big, good car and bad car. So, and this is kind of like my story about the diamonds or whatever, right? No one knows whether the good car is good or bad. And hence, the, just a generic car gets sold at the average price. The average price is, so the seller on average thinks it's worth, I don't know, on three, the buyer on average thinks it's worth five. So four is in between those. Okay. All right, so this is what we did last time. Okay, so now um, let's consider the case where there's somebody who has an information limit. Okay, so now say that, um, let's see, maybe the seller knows, but the buyer doesn't. Okay, so. Okay, let's see. Now what happens here? Okay, here, the seller has two notes. Right? The seller is able to tell it's about a good car. Okay, before we had a vote. Okay, let's see. Um, if I were to do the Nash equilibrium, okay, what changes? Yeah, exactly. Right. We have this, but more stuff. It's like you can do four, six, or six, one. So I think. Um, let's do this. Oh, so now we do to write up this. Buyers are the same. Right? And I think the top and the bottom are the same, right? This is four, except, right? Three minus one. 
and then this is going to be 6, and that's except, right? So this is 6 except, so it's 1. I think that's right, right? Two. So it's going to be 2, 0. How about this? It's 4 except, 6 reject, right? So this is going to be 3 and that's 1 half. Okay, this is going to be 4. Reject, zero, zero, six, accept. That's going to be one, one, I think, right? Uh -huh. So it's going to be one. So this is just zero, zero. Anytime there's rejections, it's all zeros. <laughs> okay, this is now six. Now this is six, but it's this, the bubble, right? This is the round bubble here, because this is the bubble which happens if it's six, yes? So it's 6 except, so that's what? 5, maybe 3. Now this is 4 except here, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so this is going to be 2, 0. It's a 6 reject, zero, 0, 4 except, right? So Wait, isn't it six except? So look, yeah, oh, it's okay. this six, but then we end up at this bubble, so we look at this guy, uh -huh. right? Okay, yeah. And then, then it's going to be four, but then it's that except, so it's four except minus one. I think it's right. Okay. 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 Why? Why isn't it six except and four reject? Okay, so hold on. Six. Who's saying the person got the six here, right? Yeah. And yeah. four yeah. here. Who's doing except down here and reject here? So this part's zero, zero. And over here, we end up minus one, three. Okay. The reason it's a little confusing because these, these things are, this is, these, these conditions are different from these. Right, so this is like if bad, okay. and this is if good, right? And then but these are if four. If four yeah, exactly, right, right, exactly. Okay. Done. Okay, this is six, and then accept, right? So it's four, minus three. Yeah, six accept, and then four. Now we just reject. So zero. This is one times three. Okay. What's the best response here? Um, one. Uh, for person one. So if you. If person two, if the buyer accepts everything, <coughs> yeah, exactly. If the buyer accepts everything, you seller always gives the highest price. Okay, what if the buyer does this? Best response is three. He has, right? Exactly. Five. Wait, no, three. Three, right? And yeah. they're indifferent. Best response here is one. Best response here is half. Here is the special response. Here is zeros. What are the Nash equilibria? Um, zero, zero. Yeah. I think this is the only one, exactly. Okay, let's see. Is this a PBNE? Okay, so I think both people are doing both. Both good and bad cars, number 26. Okay. And it's rejected all the time. Okay, what beliefs do we put here? Yeah, it has to be half half, right? Because that's that's pinned down by the seller's actions. Every seller, every seller charges six, so if you hear see the price of six, you believe. But beliefs go there. This is not pinned down, right? So um, we want to make it so that rejecting is yeah. um, one, you know, one zero. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. We don't have to put beliefs here anymore, right? Because there's no bubble. Before we did. Okay. <laughs> Given these beliefs, is the buyer be sequentially rational here? 
Yeah, because you just made a maximum. Now the bar being here, it's a nice rational. So you get zero if they were doing A, you would get minus one, so that makes a question. How about this seller? They're getting a zero if they were to deviate, they would get zero. Right. That's kind of similar over here, they're getting zero. So this is a convenient. Okay, all right. So, what's the punchline? If Everyone knows that you can have some trade. Yeah, well, we, we had a trade, for example, here, right? The good card gets sold. If no one knows, you have at least one national equilibrium where trade occurs, in which the car was tra traded at the price which is sort of in between the averages. What if the seller knows and the buyer doesn't? So the seller has some in informational advantage. The only national equilibrium in which, which trade does not occur. Okay, why is that? Well. The simple answer is that in this case, is, this is the equilibrium where trade occurred before. This is where the car traded at four, right? The average price. When I move over here, the seller can condition on more things. Hence, the seller has more strategies, right? So it sort of makes sense, right? If I got rid of this stuff, this would be still the Nash equilibrium. But I added more stuff, so this was Nash the equilibrium might go away. Why does it go away? This is the one, one before. This went away because of what? The deviation to where? Yeah, to this, yes? What does this mean? Okay, before, if you were the seller and you were here, you could de get the three halves, okay? Because you could play AR, okay? Now you, sorry, you could play what? Four, six, right? You can only play six, six, or four, four, right? Okay, this is an actual good thing. Now you can do better because you can condition more you can deviate to this. What does that mean? Okay, this means what? The seller, was, sorry, the buyer is accepting at four and rejecting at six. Okay, if I charge, if the seller charges four all the time, then both cars will be sold, yeah? Okay, and overall people will get ones. However, if you're, Oh, so if, okay, if you're have the bad so this this is a bad good okay if you have the good car okay I'm gonna get this right okay before you're doing four four you're getting these things right now however you can do you get the six get you can get the the good car right you can sell it at six right you can offer six if you know it's a good car. Right? If you offer it six, what happens? Rejects, right? Yeah, exactly, because the, the buyer doesn't buy it, right? You know what's going on here. Before, both the seller both offers four for both, okay? However, now the seller wants to offer six for the good car. Why is that? It's because remember, if it's a good car, the seller, what is it? The seller doesn't want to sell a good car for the price of six. Yeah? Does that make sense? For the seller, it's only worth five. Okay, so think about it again. On average, the car to the seller is worth three, right? So if it doesn't know what the, whether the car is worth, they'll be happy to sell it at four. Okay? This is what, what that, that's what's going on here. That's what's going on here. Yes. However, if the seller knows what the, whether the car is worth, is the seller always happy selling it at four? No, right? The seller will only sell it if it's a bad car. Right? Okay. The seller, if it knows a good car, is because I'm not going to sell a good car for. I'm going to charge something higher. Okay. So, what happens then? Huh? So, it's like we're not going to send this. I'm not going to, if I basically. Uh, I'm not going to sell you this, this uh, um, little bag of diamonds for like $100,000 if I know that some of the diamonds are really good. I'm, like, I'm going to take those out, right? Okay. All right, so let's think about it this way now. If you're the buyer, okay, and you offered, you get offered the um, four, okay, what do you do? Okay, so before, you got offered four and you bought it. 
Okay. Now you get offer four, you don't buy it. Why is that? Yeah. Because you know it's a bad car. Because you know that the seller knows. Exactly right, exactly right, right, exactly, exactly right. You, you know it's a bad car, right? Because if it's a good car, the seller would not have sold it at four. Right? Mm. Make sense? Don't buy cheap cars. <laughs> right? So, yeah, so it's this, this kind of thing. So that, that's what yeah. this kind of gets at, right? You know, so um, this belief. Um, it corresponds to that. So, so you'd rather buy a car from someone who doesn't know the true value of the car? Yeah. Well, again, <laughs> what this means. Well, I guess, well, I mean, That's it's true. kind of like why they're, you know, like, I don't know, Carfax or something like that. You know, like, for example, like, so say that everyone can get a, a perfect estimate of the price of the car. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're, like, then yeah. we're in this situation. It's kind of better, not just for the, you might think this is better, this is worse for, like, a car dealer's point of view because they can't trick anyone, right? But if people, everyone knows it actually, it's actually good for both sides, right? It would be more like a situation like this. So either, you know, it's like the diamonds and the envelope situation, or everyone knows everything. But what's really not good is if someone knows something. Um, so okay. so people use the term informational asymmetry or something like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so that's Nobel Prize worthy work right there. You'd get paid for the last dodge. <laughs> 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 you wrote the paper in 1979. I'm sure the guy who wrote this is David Akerlof. Um, no, George Akerlof, he gets, um, uh, he's probably retired now, but I'm sure he gets paid fine. <laughs> he probably owns a house, too. <laughs> yeah. Probably. <laughs> Wait, where was he? He's at UC Berkeley. Yeah. So does, it, does, does just like this game on its own get at, like, like James Strong has this whole idea of like, like countries should want to divulge information when there is asymmetry, but, right. but there are sort of reasons why they won't, but, but even sort of starting with that, the first part of that, like, does this basic set of the game, if we're in this world, will, will we move to be kind of more complete information? Well, Does that make sense? Like, um, mm -hmm. yeah, like, uh, how, yeah, well, well, what's maybe a, a better question is how do we formalize sort of like moving from, from one state to Yeah, okay. Yeah. You could have like another game where like somebody, so person one chooses like a game with lots of bubbles and one with a fewer bubbles or something like that. Mm -hmm. and you could do it that way and then sure. say, you know, give me. We know the other will, will happen because. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you would solve, you know, so you could do that. And then, um, a lot of there's a lot of results which are similar in flavor. So like, I, I, I mean, we could talk about Jeff's paper and then talk about it. And then, um, but it's very, you know, there's a lot of things like which are not intuitive. It's yeah. kind of like going back to the other things we examples we did. You know, like, you know, the karaoke versus restaurant thing. Like, certain cases you don't want to know. It's better for everyone that doesn't know. And certain cases, you know, so it, it can go in lots of different directions. I guess. So. Um, We'll do some more examples like that too. But um, anyway, this is one of the classic ones. But there's there is a similar one in, in war, like with something like, you know, you, it's much better, it's a much safer situation where you can, um, you know, if you can show for sure that I have like a weapon or not, and not have any, you know, doubt about it. If it was for sure, then you would say, oh, okay, I understand. But if you have a different belief than I do, and I can't credibly show that I really am, it's really true. And it's kind of like this, you, know, you think I'm bluffing, I'm not, not that kind of stuff. So that kind of model you can make is sort of similar. So, right. Too much gossiping today, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of academic socialization or something. <laughs> 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 uh, we'll talk more later. So okay, next week we'll do more and more stuff. Yeah. Huh? That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Really, the best thing, like for example, like um, I'm thinking about my kids. My kids are like 20 six and 24 or something like that like maybe i'll try to help them buy a house in los angeles you know because 10 years from now might be really super impossible but then i'm thinking i'm actually part of the problem right because like if young people like try to buy houses they have it's not fair for them to compete against parents of their age, mm -hmm. yeah. you know because like you know it, it's not clear right but the, the existence of people like me makes it harder for sure right but i also don't you know I, i'd rather do this for my kids you know so you know i really don't know the best thing is. You balance it by advocating for more development <laughs> in Los Angeles. That'd be, okay. that'd be more than. I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Or you could split your lot and, and, and have your own friend team. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Part of your lot, yeah. Okay, that's an idea. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.
Yeah, well, that's a good idea. Take okay. care of you right there, right? Okay, exactly, okay. So that's a good idea. nice gift, half the house, <laughs> and then they can rent out the other duplex. Okay, for, you know, all right. Okay, cool. Wow. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. You, should, you should marry Gordon. <laughs> exactly. That's right. I've got a great power play. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a really good idea. Isn't it like zoning things though? Like, yeah, it's not allowed. You can't do that. Yeah. No, no. The, the, the zoning I mean, that, thing, is, that is now allowed. Yeah. Zoning things change completely now. You know that? It, it has, yeah. yeah. Now you can, you can build a duplex basically anywhere. Yeah. No, you can't. Really? Well. I right, asked that as a question. No, no, because so the state law changed it like a little like a year yeah. ago, very SB, recently. SB9, yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly.